So this video we're going to look at the Audi A3, which engines are the best, and how you would go about tuning them. This is going to be based very much on my real world experience of owning Audi A3. So I'm not going to be enthusiastic about mods because I've just taken it out of the box because the sponsor's paying me to say nice things. I'm going to give the real world opinion of having a mod done and living with it. And at the end I'm going to flag up a few mods that are best avoided. They're often quite common things that I see a lot of people doing to their cars. But in my experience on a daily drive that you want to keep reliable they really are detrimental So I've had quite a few Audi A3s over the years. So this video, we're going to look at the Audi A3, which engines are the best and how you would go about tuning them. So I'm basing this very much on my own personal experience and I would love to hear your experiences in your comments. Um, so please throw up a comment below, tell us what you've got, what you've done and what you think about the different engines in the models. So there's been quite a few generations of the Audi A3 as it's come out over the years and I've had every generation up to the very latest one and I'm, I feel I'm in a good place to make comparisons and draw conclusions on them. The first one I had was a Mark 1, it was purple, I went for the 1.8T. With any of the A3s I would strongly recommend that the power figure you go for is about 140, 150 horsepower. Anything less than that in my opinion feels slow you might be arguing for fuel economy but if that's the case the diesels offer superb fuel economy at about 140 brake horsepower for the 2 litre TDI. There are lower powered versions around but I really don't recommend those especially if you want to tune the car. So the 2 litre TDI with the 140 engine you can take up to 170 fairly easily. The 109 horsepower engines take a bit more work to get up there. But the 1.8 turbos, the 2 litre turbos, are fantastic petrol engines. There's lots of tuning options for them and lots of things you can do to them to improve them. The more recent 1.4 1.5 TFSIs offer really good levels of power and fuel economy and make a really good choice. And the plus point is that these engines are smaller and lighter, so the car will feel much quicker than it would with an equivalent 2 litre diesel engine. So you'll notice that traction becomes an issue around about 220 horsepower unless you're using a Quattro. If you swap the differential out for a better quality diff, a semi-locking diff, a Torsen diff, it can make a big difference to getting that power down and improves the cornering and handling of your car. But really for the higher powered conversions and the high power projects, you really do need to base it on a Quattro. So the first thing I would always address with an Audi A3 is the handling. So they come from the factory with fairly soft suspension unless you've got the S-Line version and a lot of people have said that the S-Line springs are quite harsh and quite hard and that's certainly been my experience with an A3. You can feel every little bump and ripple in the road which is nice as a driver's car but for long journeys and for the daily commute it can be a little bit much and some coilover kits really do enhance the handling so they maintain the sharp precision handling and you won't get such sudden dramatic jolts and bumps and shocks from the road so they're much better at absorbing that. And in a couple of models that I've had, the S-Line springs have actually broke on me. So that's certainly something to watch out for. And if a spring does break on you, I'd recommend you just get them all done. Don't mess around. It's a sign that you've got a bad batch on the car and it's quite likely that the next three are going to go in the next sort of six months or so. So as far as handling goes, that set of coilovers makes a big difference. The bushings, the rubber mounts that the suspension on do tend to wear over time. So getting those replaced with better quality alternatives, there's polyurethane, you can get that in various grades of stiffness. So I'd still recommend you go fairly soft. You don't want all those vibrations coming into the cabin and vibrations don't actually improve handling it causes the wheels and tyres to skip over the road surface. So nice soft poly bushes or just a new set of rubber bushes can make a massive difference to the handling if your A3 suspension bushings have become worn and degraded with time. So moving on to the brakes, you've actually got a massive array of options and brake upgrades because most of the Volkswagen Audi Group hubs are the same. So in most cases, a few exceptions, some of the smaller engine cars had slightly smaller hubs and there are a few other things out there that you've got to watch. But generally speaking, you can bolt on 
the larger wheel discs, hubs, calipers and brake pads from a more powerful model. So you might add the S brakes or the RS brakes to a basic model A3 to enhance the stopping power. You need to watch that you've got enough space in the actual alloy wheel to house the brakes safely and allow it to cool and dissipate that heat effectively. So for most cases you're looking at about 18 inch wheels for that and we've seen people fitting Porsche brakes and the Volkswagen Golf brakes there's some really nice setups for the Golf R out there and the the nice thing about all these brake upgrades is you can just go to your local breakers yard and see what they've got and you can get a decent set of upgraded brake components much more cheaply than it would cost you to go out and buy a big brake conversion kit. So we've dealt with the handling and we've dealt with the stopping power of the car so let's think now about the engine and how we would improve that. So the first no-brainer is if you've got the turbo engine and if you're aiming at 140, 150 brake horsepower, chances are that engine is going to come with a turbo anyway. A remap is definitely the option to go for. So a remap on a petrol or diesel engine will generally give you about 20 to 30% more power without even breaking a sweat. On the diesels, the annoying thing is you get more fuel economy from them. It makes them much more efficient. You've got to watch the map isn't too aggressive because you can get a bit of smoke and it can cause havoc with your DPF filters and other components within the engine. So make sure whoever maps the car knows what they're doing. The best setup really is to get your car set up on a rolling road. That way they can take into account every little nuance of your personal engine. They're all different. They come out of the factory and they're not all built to exactly the same tolerances. No matter what manufacturers claim, there are variations. So some cars remap and you get more power. Others struggle to make as much power. But in most cases, you will get substantially more power when you've remapped it. So it would be better though to get even more power out of it. So although a remap can add a lot of power, if you adjust the turbo itself and go with a hybrid turbo or a larger turbo unit, you really can max the power gain. So the early A3s used a selection of turbos from the K03, which had a safe maximum limit of about 190. You can exceed that, and I've known them to be pushed to about 220 horsepower. But by doing that, you really do reduce the lifespan of the turbo. The K03S, which was an evolution of the K03, that was safe to about 215 horsepower and spooled up nicely from fairly low RPMs. The maximum on that is around 250 horsepower where you start seeing the turbo life diminishing and the bigger K04 was fitted to the high performance derivatives of the engines and the safe maximum for those was typically about 220 horsepower that sort of ballpark but I have known those to be pushed to about 350 so there's quite a bit of headroom in those K04 turbos. On the later models we see the Honeywell turbos and a series of turbos the IHI IS12, IS20 and the IS38 and we'll be covering those turbos in more detail because there's quite a bit you can do to swap the turbos over to the higher powered units or just replace them with a hybrid so there really is a whole world of options there for your A3 engine. We've seen people almost doubling the power of some models so on our site we've got lots of engine specific guides that go into the power limits on stock blocks for example the 1.8T petrol hitting 350 brake horsepower on the stock internals and that was the AGU block which has forged components inside it and it's got a slightly larger head but all the details of that are on our site we've got specific pages that go into great detail on every single generation of engine that Audi have produced so common things that common problems that you tend to have with the turbo engines is the recirculation valve is often sticky if you've upped the power dramatically then it makes sense to upgrade that circulation valve as well and that's what Audi do when they produce higher powered versions they generally fit a slightly larger capacity turbo and the valves that they use within the turbo to control the airflow and the wastegate are also uprated accordingly so that they can maintain reliability of their cars. The intercoolers that they fit on A3s are generally quite small. You're much better off having a larger one mounted on the front. Now that usually necessitates a little bit of modification to the front bumper but 
lots of people have made them fit. There's lots of photographs around of how people have achieved that. It just sits in front of the radiator at the front of the engine and choosing an intercooler, it's a little bit of an art. You won't add power as such by fitting an intercooler. You just stop it from losing power. So as the intercooler itself warms up, it starts to become less and less effective at cooling that air charge that's coming out of the turbo. And that's where you start losing power. They call that heat soak. So a larger intercooler will resist heat soak for a much longer period of time than the stock factory one. So if you're starting to notice that the power is tailing off, that could well be where the bottleneck is in your entire system. So this brings us to intakes, induction kits and the like. So every Audi A3 I've had, I've done something to the intake, but generally I've not really noticed much of a power increase. And that's borne out by dyno results time and time again. When you put an induction kit on a car, it doesn't make more power. Induction kits are there to remove restrictions on the intakes. And as far as most Audi A3s go, there is no restriction in the intake. They've got very well designed air boxes, quite a large paper air filter. I would recommend replacing that air filter with a better flowing sports panel filter. I've used the K&N cotton gauze filters to great effect. You can clean them so they've got quite a bit of longevity. And they do become essential when you start doing the remaps and the turbo upgrades. That's typically when you'll start to see a little bit of a restriction at the top end and you'll want to just free that up. So the main reason people would fit an induction kit is for that lovely induction roar. It does sound great. The diesel engines not so much but the petrol engines do sound fantastic with an induction kit on. So if you're just after the benefits of the nice induction noise by all means fit an induction kit but remember to have a cold air feed taking fresh air from the outside to it. You don't want to be sucking in the warm engine bay temperatures because that's going to carry less oxygen and you'll be making less power as a result of that. So coming on to some more complex mods we should start to think about the clutch. We typically see those slipping when you've hiked your power by about 30 to 40 percent it depends a lot on model to model and how well the car's been looked after and what the condition of the clutch is. But basically if your clutch is starting to near the end of its life, remapping it, changing the turbo is just enough to push it over the edge. So we would certainly recommend getting an uprated clutch. I did go too severe with one of my cars and had lots of problems with the clutch. It was just too heavy in operation. It broke no end of clutch cables and I wish I'd just chosen a, a more sensible midway option between the full race spec and a road butch and there are options out there. So if you're messing around with the clutch you may as well think about the flywheel as well. So changing the flywheel, that great big mass that sits between the engine and the clutch and the transmission and it stores the kinetic energy from the engine as it rotates. So making that a little bit lighter will just make the car rev more freely. It doesn't particularly add power, it reduces weight overall, which is always a good thing, it's always a benefit. The diesel engines and a lot of the other models actually come with a dual mass flywheel. So they've actually got two plates with a spring mechanism connecting them. And that's designed to reduce the vibrations that you get. Now on the diesels, that's an essential. I've heard from a lot of people that have fitted single mass like flywheels on diesel engines and have regretted it. They've just had lots of vibrations, problems with smooth running and idling and all kinds of other issues. So do your research carefully before you think about fitting a lighter flywheel to your car. But coming into the engine itself, we start to look at making the engine a lot more efficient. You want to get the engine burning more air and fuel. The better the engine is at burning the air and fuel mix, the more power you will make. So enlarging the valves, doing work on the head, making sure that the air channels flow nicely into each of the cylinders can make quite a big difference. Again, I tend to think of that more as a petrol mod than the diesel mod. Diesels tend to operate in much lower RPM ranges. So a lot of the mods that you would do on a petrol car won't make much difference because of the narrow power band output that you get with diesels but the benefit you've had with the diesel is you get massive power with just doing a remap or swapping out the turbo so back on the petrol engines changing the cam profile will alter the duration and lift of the valves on the intake and the exhaust 
and that can help you to make more power but don't go too aggressive because that can make the car very lumpy in its everyday operation the idling can become quite erratic you often have to crank up the tick over just to stop the car from stalling and it can be quite hard to drive in everyday traffic when you've got a fast road cam that's too aggressive so changing out the valves for larger valves is a, another way you obviously need to enlarge the ports that those valves go into but there are a few big valve conversion kits around for most of the popular a3 engines out there so other options we're just going to flag up at the end of the video that people may not necessarily have thought about are things like tuning boxes now they get a bad press because there's so many bad units out there that do little more than just dump extra fuel into the engine but there are a few decent tuning boxes that act more like a piggyback ECU. So the interface between the sensors on your engine's ECU and the sensors on the engine, they lie about air temperatures, fuel, RPMs, and they recalculate what's needed and just make sure everything is running within a tighter set of parameters. A tuning box can often make significantly more power, not usually as much as you would get with a bespoke custom rolling road remap but it's an easy way of just plugging something into the car and getting a lot more power out of it. Think too about brake pads. Don't go too aggressive with those brake pads either. You don't want race spec pads that need to be worn before they actually bite. If you're using your A3 on the road, you want your pads to be quite effective. So I've used Paget pads and I really like Paget pads. They seem to be a really good compromise between having a decent fast road pad and a pad that you can live with every single day. And they're really good at stopping the car. They outperform a lot of the other pads that I've tried. I've also tried EBC Green Stuffs. They were quite good. In my personal experience, I really like the Paget pads. They just seem to bite better and they gave more performance in stopping. So your tire choice can also make a difference. We've got quite a few videos on tires, but don't go with big alloy wheels. I personally prefer about 17 inches on an A3. I've had 19 inches and they were okay in the dry, but in the wet, they weren't as good as 17s. So for everyday driving, I really do recommend thinking about just sticking with 17 inch alloys. And there are some nice looking sets out there. You would probably argue that 18s fill the arches more nicely. And I've seen people with 19s but in almost every case where you've gone to the really large size of alloy wheel, people have had problems with tram lining. You're adding a lot of unsprung weight to the car and that does adversely affect its handling. It'd be a shame if you spent so much effort tuning up your A3 to just throw it all away with really large alloy wheels. So we've got future videos planned in our schedule. So we're going to cover each of the models of A3 in more detail. We're going to go into the engines with some engine specific guides and some troubleshooters on things that we should look out for. So please subscribe to the channel. Make sure you don't miss out on those. Don't forget to stay tuned. Throw us up a like because that really helps us to get out there. And please let me know in the comments what model you've got, what you've done to it, what what mods worked, what your experience has been with your A3, because that helps me to shape future video content and future video features. And please let me know what you think of this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.